So welcome back to the Science of Inspiration Summit, especially you, the freedom fighters, the entrepreneurs, and the wantrepreneurs. In this summit, you will not only learn about your unlimited potential, but also the science behind it. And you will continue to receive inspiration to move on on your entrepreneurial journey to move onward and upward. I'm very honored and privileged to invite our guest today, Mel Schwartz. And let me introduce Mel to you real quick. Mel is a psychotherapist, marriage counselor, author, speaker, and corporate leadership and communication consultant. He practices in Westport, Connecticut and Manhattan and works globally. He earned his LCSW from Columbia University and masters in philosophy from Lancaster University in England. He is one of the first contemporary practicing psychotherapists to distill the basic premises of quantum theory into therapeutic approaches which enable people to overcome their challenges and live in their fullest potential. Mel's first book, The Art of Intimacy, The Pleasure of Passion, broke new ground in illuminating the path to joyful relationships and has benefited countless people. He's the author of The Possibility Principle, How Quantum Physics Can Improve the Way You Think, Live and Love. His blog, A Shift, at, Shift of Mind at psycholo psychologytoday.com has been viewed by more than 3 million readers. His TEDx talk, Overcoming Anxiety, is viewed by more than 50,000 people a month. So Mel is a member of the Society of, for Consciousness Studies and has been interviewed by numerous TV, radio, and print media. And with that, Mel, welcome so much. Thank you so much for being part of this summit and welcome to you. My pleasure. Excited to join you. And that was certainly a mouthful you went through. I wish you had abbreviated it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was going through your background. It is it is really impressive, and and I think what um, attracted me the most is this quantum physics part. And you know the 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 summit topic or the title, as you know, is the science behind inspiration. I really wanted to tap into your mind to understand, you know, what is quantum physics? How does it apply to us? And especially in the entrepreneurial world. So I'll ask you a few questions around that, Mel. Uh, and and you know, the first question that uh, you know comes to mind is you know first of all i don't think psychotherapist was your main career to begin with if I'm, if I'm not mistaken right you chose to become a psychotherapist later i had been in business entrepreneurially owning my own business until i was approaching the age of 40 and i had what i call a defining moment you know, we always have insights, but usually, sadly, we wet, let our insights fade away. But I believe that when you have an insight which is significant, we should grab a hold of it. And so driving home one day from my office in Manhattan, driving to my dream home that I had built with my two young children and my wife, who became my former wife, I had an epiphany which was I wanted more meaning and purpose in my life. I was living what I thought was the right life, the dream life, and making very ample income, but there was something insufficient and lacking. And I got home that evening and told my former wife to, to her dismay that I was going to close the business. And she alarmedly said, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. I went to sleep that night excited like a child before their birthday party. And I recalled many years earlier, someone had asked me, what do you enjoy doing? I remembered my answer. It was, I love helping people think differently, getting insights. So then I asked myself, well, what could that look like? So by the morning I had it, I thought psychotherapy, writing, giving workshops, doing seminars. So I headed off to graduate school on my next effort, which is still an entrepreneurial effort, by the way, even though it's, you know, it's a profession. And to succeed, you need the entrepreneurial spirit. And that's what brought me here. Um, several years after that separation, um, I had another turning point. Um, I was blessed in that I got to raise my young sons entirely on my own, so I didn't have to be without them. But on one particular weekend, they were away and out with me. And I went out for a bike ride on a beautiful spring day. And in the midst of it, I experienced, for the first time in my life, an anxiety attack. 
my anxiety was about the uncertainty of my future. New career, I had just come out of graduate school. How would I earn sufficient money? What would future relationships look like? I got anxious. I rode the bike home, not knowing what relief I'd get getting back into my house. I absentmindedly pulled a book off the bookshelf and it was called The Turning Point, aptly, by a quantum physicist named Fridjof Taffer. And I was reading about this paradigm shift that was starting to occur based upon the science dating back to the 1930s. Now I should share with everybody that I was a mediocre science student at best. So when I talk about quantum physics, this is on the level that any lay person can understand because that's all I am. But here's what I read, that reality was thoroughly uncertain. Now, we had been trained in 17th century thinking coming from Newton, which told us determinism, predictability. Today, let's call it data. If we have enough data, we can reasonably predict the future. But I had come to understand that people who get stuck in analyzing and predicting operate in fear, and that's the cause of anxiety. Anxiety comes from needing to know the future, which you can't know for sure. So I had a thought, which was, if uncertainty is the reality of the universe, coming to us from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, then I thought, what if I embrace uncertainty? And then I had a pivotal insight, and I created an equation. Uncertainty equals possibility. So that was my first bedrock principle. Embrace uncertainty. Now, clearly, in entrepreneurial efforts, we must embrace uncertainty. Love, romance is an embrace of uncertainty. So my talk, Overcoming Anxiety is Rooted in This. It's one of the principles in my book, The Possibility Principle. And I've created a podcast, which is called The Possibility Podcast, all about this. Um, the second feature was that the universe exists in a state of pure potential. That reality doesn't exist. It's happening nanosecond by nanosecond. And so I thought metaphorically that we exist in this state of pure potential, but to access that potential, I need to create a space between my thoughts. Because if I keep having the same thoughts, I'm never going to access that state of potential. So I developed a method. And I, in my laboratory was my therapy office, where over the years I developed a method to help people see their thought, not become the thought, and create this space where intuitive wisdom arises. It's not limited to analyzing. You know, analyzing should be a tool in the toolbox of our mind, but not the only one. And so I find that for me, great moments and great insights do not come from analyzing. They come from quieting my mind and tapping into a universal energy field which provides the way for me. So that's what launched me in this path. Fascinating. And, and you said, uh, Mel, that somewhere around when you were 40 is when you pivoted into this, into this new area, which is very encouraging, should be encouraging for our audience. Uh, I'm in my mid forties. I pivoted last year. So age is, age doesn't matter when you start, doesn't matter as long as you start basically. That's right. You, as, as long as you start, and the later you start in a way, the better, because you no longer feel that age. In other words, I feel currently like as though I'm 20 or 25 years younger than I am because there's adventure in front of me. Very nice. So you started uh, delving into a little bit what quantum physics is, um, but can you explain to our audience what is quantum physics? Is this a Certainly. new form of science or, or has been around for a while? So quantum refers to the very small, micro, very small. So physics before quantum physics was just known as physics, which was essentially Newtonian physics, the physics of the observable, the large, where you didn't need a, a, a super microscope to see what was going on because there is a reality that's not visible to the visible eye. That's the realm of the quantum. So. Einstein ushered this in, but Einstein in some ways remained a traditionalist. 
Einstein's rival, or I, I shouldn't say rival, but the great, his great peer was named Niels Bohr, a Danish physicist, going to share a thought experiment that they debated for decades, which revolutionized our understanding of reality. In quantum physics, again, the reality of the very small, reality operates altogether differently than it would seem to operate on our level. Now, when two particles, let's call them photons, two particles, when they have a shared state, they're in proximity to each other, they develop an affinity to each other. They have a shared state, like two people in love. Two people in love, even though they're separate, their hearts are still beating as one to speak metaphorically. So these photons have a spin. Um, they spin either negatively or positively, but they operate as a twin. Now, and they are operating in negative spin or rotation, the opposite of each other. So now the question was raised by Einstein. If these two photons were separated by a great distance, Let's imagine they're separated by half the universe, incredibly large distance, and we change the spin of one. What would happen to its twin photon half a universe away? Now, both Bohr and Einstein agreed its twin would have to change its spin because they operate in tandem. The question was, how long would it take? Einstein calculated a signal would be sent. It couldn't be faster than the speed of light. Niels Bohr said, no signal, no time will elapse. There is no separation. The universe is as one, inseparable. Now, Einstein could not tolerate that. He believed in causality, rational thinking. I think Einstein in response says, if this was true, I'd rather be a cobbler than a physicist. Now, the world of quantum physics is divided in two different camps, hmm. Einstein and Bohr. And what Bohr was saying was that reality operates the way the Eastern mystics have always told us, one inseparable whole. Or Carl Jung, the famous psychiatrist, who called it unus mundus, one reality, one hmm. world. Well, after Einstein's death, um, in 1962, I believe, an Irish physicist named John Wheeler created the formula to test this debate. Mm. And many years later, I believe in the 1980s, a French scientist for the first time tested the theory. Einstein lost. No signal was sent. The change was instantaneous. Now, this experiment has been performed countless times with increasingly greater technology, same result. There's no signal. No matter what the distance, they're operating as one. Fascinating. So that creates the concept of inseparability. Mm -hmm. Now, by the way, the skeptic at this moment would say, sure, Mel, that's great, but that's in the quantum world. What does that have to do with us? Well, increasingly in our world, which we call the macro world, we're seeing evidence of the same thing happening. So our best recollection of this could be, not recollection, but our, our, our best take on this would be, imagine there's a twin, two twins. Now let's imagine he lives in San Francisco and he falls in the shower and breaks his ankle. And in that instant, his twin sister living in Paris feels a pain in her ankle. Now, there is one. Again, the skeptic would say, well, they have shared DNA okay to the skeptic, but this happens all the time mm. without being twins. Jung called it synchronicity. We have countless examples whereby we can operate on a different level and we can simply know because there is an inseparability. The reason we don't experience it is we were trained and rooted in compartmentalized thinking. I think about university. There's a history department, a sociology department, a religion department, and we think of these separate silos as real. They're not. Our mind makes up all these separate compartments, forgets that it made it up, and we think of the compartments as real. This in turn creates what is called fragmented thinking, where we go through life like this with blinders on, 
and we don't see wholeness. So you can imagine in business, in entrepreneurship, in leadership, in all aspects of life, when we can take the blinders off and envision wholeness, it is, it is so much more generative and beneficial. So I trained myself to not accept compartments which are made up. When I'm asked a question, which would be what we call an either or question. Well, Mel, do you think, is this good or is this bad? I will not answer, cannot answer the question because I don't accept the, the made up compartments or categories. Mm -hmm. So I train my mind to think in what I call either and or, right? Sometimes the either works and sometimes it's neither and or. This is inclusive thinking. And if the planet is going to survive and humankind is going to survive, we need to engage that level of complexity because it's the oversimplification that creates hatred, greed, mm -hmm. all of the isms in the world. But when we can engage complexity, we see the way forward. Very, very interesting. So you you started delving into the point of you know how this impacts our mind and maybe you know we 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 have trained our minds or we got trained by our parents siblings environment to compartmentalize and have a fragmented thinking so how can how can quantum physics help us uh, maybe overcome that point or or what does quantum physics say scientifically that can help us maybe upgrade our mindset from an entrepreneurial perspective. And so quantum physics, as far as I know, and again, I'm a lay person, not a scientist, it doesn't address this. Where I learned and where my thinking comes from is I look at the science, I look at some philosophy, and I think, well, if this is true, inseparability, and then I look at philosophy and I say, if this is true, I bring them together in my own thinking and it creates an alchemy for me. I said, wow. So then I start to create my own method. For instance, if we lived through the reality of inseparability, then empathy and compassion would be normal, right? Because you and I operate as one. So I would want to have compassion and empathy for you because you're not really separate from me. But when we operate out of the illusion of separation which came to us from newton i'll explain why newton creates a reality which is called the machine-like universe mechanism now that machine-like universe that reality was literally machine-like with separate discrete parts disconnected from each other ultimately we became the separate parts in the machine now separate parts in the machine have no meaning connection or purpose which would lead to depression and anxiety and to extreme greed and excessive individualism. Like when I work with a couple, I may ask, would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? So, well, of course we'd rather be happy. But immediately the fight ensues about who's right and wrong. Hmm. That comes from the illusion of separation. If I need to prove you wrong, how's that gonna work out for me in our relationship? See, we've been entrained to think in terms of victory takes all, right versus wrong, not understanding that there are win-wins that we can come to. So the science doesn't inform this um, at the risk of sounding boastful. My book and my work is about the way I've taken the science and extrapolated into a method for living without fear, living resiliently, creating a whole communication system based upon this. I gave another TEDx talk on the communication system where there are eight simple words that we should really not use. And we use them in every sentence. And those are the two B verbs. So the two B verbs, be, been, am, as, were, is. As verbs are all unique in that they are inert. They're fixed. They're not moving. Every other verb shows movement. The two B verbs don't. And yet reality, quantum physics tells us that reality is inexorably flowing, never inert. Mm -hmm. But we use these words in every sentence that speak of fixed objective reality. And it gets us stuck. So someone says, 
I am a, I'm a loser. I am a loser. Fixed. You charge someone something when you say you are fixed. Nowhere to go from that. We live in a participatory reality where my subjective impression creates reality. So if you remove the to be verbs and say, I feel like a loser. I've always felt like a loser. Okay, how come? What are your beliefs about yourself? How did you come to those beliefs? We can start to shift. So I was fascinated and remain fascinated as to how we can use these principles of connectivity, inseparability, pure potential and uncertainty to help us thrive and prosper in all aspects of our lives. So that's been my mission for the last 15 years. So uh, that, that's, that's very fascinating, Mel, but can I, maybe you, I would like, you, like to put a statement in front of you and you can tell me if this makes sense. So sure. uh, extrapolating, you know, the, the example that you gave. So let's say I'm an entrepreneur and I am not rich is a fact but not my truth because I can become rich if I do something in the future. So that is like, I'm not rich is not reality, but it's just a fact at a given point of time. So I, well, let's remove the word am. Okay. Let's remove the to be verb. I don't have as much in my bank account. I don't have the assets at this moment that I wish I did. That's a subjective reality. I wish I had more assets. I wish I had more wealth. Fine. How do I move in that direction? Uh, I see. I got it. I got it. Okay. That makes sense. Now, you know, uh, and, and the book that you were referring to is the possibility principle, right? The, That's the, correct. The, okay. Yeah. And, and I want the audience to know that this book is an amazing book and a must read for you guys. If you want to understand a little bit more about the application of quantum physics in your life, right? That is why I think it's a must read. Now, I think in some way in the introduction about this book, you say that quantum physics reveals a world that is extraordinarily interconnected and exists in a state of pure potential. Uh, and you spoke about this in your introduction. Now, is pure potential unlimited potential as well? Yes. So I believe in infinite possibility. Okay. So the only thing that limits infinite possibility is the restrictions that our beliefs and thoughts create, mm -hmm. right? Now, the cynic might say, well, death is inevitable. Look at the word is, death is inevitable. I'd say to this point in time, no one has lived that has not perished. That would be an accurate statement. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the future holds. How can any of us have that audacity or arrogance to say? So reality doesn't exist. When someone says reality is, in completes the sentence, they're making an error. Because the word is suggests it's fixed. You see, no, reality flows. Think about a river. And it doesn't dry up and it's perpetually flowing. Reality flows. And nanosecond by nanosecond, change is occurring. I've come to realize that the word change misleads us because change also suggests that there's the opposite of change. Mm. Right? Like the, we wouldn't have the word night if there weren't day. Right. So I now have an issue with the word change because it proposes that the opposite. But to bring this all down to our level, the portal for accessing all of this comes from our ability to see thought, our thought operating, and create a muscle memory, which I explain in my podcast and in my book, The Possibility Principle. My first thinking around the nature of thought was informed by the great late uh, quantum physicist, Nobel quantum physicist, David Bohm, B-O-H-M. And David Bohm wrote some great books. One of them was called Thought as a System. I also did some books with Krishnamurti, the Indian sage. Mm -hmm. So through Bohm, I looked at his work and then I, you know, I was going to say I furthered it, but that would sound very egotistical. He was a remarkable genius and I am not. But I took his great foundation of work 
and I headed in a different direction with it as a therapist and as a marriage counselor and doing corporate communication work to see where things get stuck. So thought tricks us in that it's telling us the truth. Mm. And one of the ways that I work with people to create a muscle memory of seeing thought is to communicate like this. This would be an example. If I said to you, you know, Anish, when you asked me that question, I had a thought come up. Let me tell you what my thought is telling me. Hmm. It's representative. It's accurate. But we don't operate that way. We have a thought. It's our truth. And we articulate the truth. And then if we don't agree, we get nowhere. So think about a relationship. Business, family, friend. The difference between saying, you're wrong, I'll tell you why. Again, we're using the to be verb, you're wrong. It goes nowhere. But instead, if you said, you know, you, when you said that, I had a thought come up. Can I tell you what my thought was telling me? You're inviting them in. Mm. It's a participatory dialogue. We don't see this in the universe we live in. Perhaps there are some indigenous cultures where it may still exist, but we don't. You know, the presidential debates are on tomorrow evening. That will be the opposite of what I am describing. Because there's no new learning. There's no breakthroughs. By the way, one of the most powerful things you can ask someone, if they say something that you disagree with, is facts don't change minds. Facts don't change opinions. What I learned to do, and this came to me in my own breakthrough. I'll share how it happened because it may be helpful to illustrate it. I was giving a talk on self-esteem, self -esteem, very, very important subject matter. And I think that the concept of self-esteem is poorly understood. And I was talking about the change process and how we can develop authentic self-esteem. This happened maybe 10 or 12 years ago. A gentleman in the audience raises his hand, he stands up. You could tell by his tone, he did not believe in what I was pitching. So I asked him, I said, so you don't believe people can change or develop self-esteem? He said, that's right. Now, I noticed my reaction. My reaction was, it was ego-driven. I was about to prove him wrong and show everyone in the audience how smart I was. I noticed my ego. I quieted myself. I, that space between the thoughts, that nanosecond of possibility, I quieted myself. I don't think anyone noticed. For me, it felt like three or four seconds. I'm sure it wasn't perceptible. And a new question came to me, which I asked him. I said, so you don't believe people can change? That's right. I said, could you tell us what informed that belief? How did you come to that belief? So he shared his childhood and lifetime experiences. And I said, well, so if you had been my sibling, raised in my family, you might have different beliefs and different experiences. Begrudgingly, he said, I guess so. So we have different beliefs. When I hear something that I vehemently disagree with, particularly if it's something I feel passionate about, I quiet myself and I say, hmm, that's an interesting belief. How did you come to that belief? And that's where things start to open up. Because you see, what we're putting forth as truth, most often, is belief. Now, I'm not saying that I don't believe in agreed upon consensual truths. I'm not an advocate of fake news, right? But in conversation with each other, when we are not seeing things eye to eye, the thing to ask is, how did you come to that belief? Because you see, it's just a belief. You don't have to be defensive and reactive. That opens up a whole new level of communication. And well, as you were illustrating your story um, about that talk, uh, certain things start coming to rushing to my mind of where I have rushed to defend uh, very passionately of what I believe in rather than being more participatory and asking a question to involve or uh, to invoke more dialogue, which might be more uh, constructive. Um, very, very, very good point you have made. And I think that 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 creating the space in thought 
is um, exactly what our Eastern culture, especially from the Indian culture that I come from, teaches us. Uh, but we don't <laughs> don't practice it. So we, we we don't, and because when we don't, then we become our reaction. Mm. You see, it happens so fast we don't even see the reaction. So what I teach and what I write about is if I can notice my reaction and communicate it, then that's responding, not reacting. So let's suppose somebody says something and I know it's making me feel angry. Now, if I say to them, hmm, you know, when you said that, I noticed that I was beginning to feel angry. Let me explain to you what it is that's making me feel angry. That's a healthy communication. But if I don't know this reaction of anger, I act angrily and everything is lost. So in communication, when I notice my thought, when I notice my feeling, and I communicate it in a participatory way, may I share my feeling with you? May I share a thought that's coming up? We're no longer finding things objectively. Well, let's talk about objectivity for a moment if we can. So in quantum physics, if we live in an inseparable reality, or as one, then the basis of objectivity falls apart. Because to be objective means I actually stand apart, separate and dispassionate. That's what objectivity requires. But in this new worldview, whereby I am connected and participating in everything, and certainly my thoughts are as well, there is no object. Now, a number of years ago, I was called for jury duty. And I am sitting in the witness seat being interviewed by the prosecutor. It was an alleged drunk driving case. And the attorney, the prosecutor, says to me, can you be objective? Well, he asked the wrong person that question. So I gave the judge and the prosecutor a little the scientific uh, uh, information. And the judge looks at me and he says, well, what should we ask you? I said, judge, do you have beliefs? He said, well, of course I have beliefs. I said, right, we all have beliefs. Beliefs are biases. Mm -hmm. We have to stop pretending that we're not biased. We're not calculating machines or computers. Pretending to be objective, number one, doesn't exist and it's not achievable. And two, it would be pathological. If you saw a heinous, the most heinous crime you can think of and you were witnessing it and someone said, can you be objective? If you could and you had no emotion, that would be pathological. Mm -hmm. No, we are perceptive, subjective people. And going back to those two B verbs, if we eliminate those two B verbs, we speak in a participatory, subjective way where my truth doesn't preclude your truth. This belief in objectivity is ruinous for communication, ultimately perhaps the survival of the planet. Some years ago, when I used to feel myself pulled into debates about global warming, I refused to say climate change. It's global warming. It was turned to climate change for political reasons. But when people would not believe in global warming, I'd sidestep it. I'd say, listen, or they didn't believe that it was humans that were creating the global warming. I'd say, suppose we noticed a meteor heading for Earth that could end life on Earth. Would you stand back and say, well, we didn't create it, so let's forget about it. We do what we have to. So let's get past this argument whether it's human-made or not. It's happening. What do we need to do so that life can continue to exist on this planet? You see, I can only learn to think that way by coming out of this Newtonian objective way of thinking. It allows me, sometimes effortlessly, to think of a different way of communicating. Again, without effort, there's so much more optimistic, mm. to get past the impasse. The impasse happens when we're rooted in this dualistic, either-or thinking. It traps us. It's horrible. I see it in medicine, in health. I see it everywhere I look. 
very very interesting point of view um yeah i i think you are as you speak mel you are uh, opening my my mind up a little bit to certain aspects that i have not thought much about um i have not read your book as yet mel but i will uh, order it and it will be on my list to read very soon the possibility principle um so um from a entrepreneur's perspective i think i i just wanted to add a few comments mel to what you said you know our belief systems are exactly what you said they are biases our paradigms our perspectives and if we continue believing that we cannot achieve something then it will become our our fact at that moment in time unless we change want to change intentionally and and i think for entrepreneurs it's very important to be conscious of what we believe in to maybe make changes to it so that we can get out of our own way to achieve what we want to isn't it certainly to be able to ask myself why do i believe what i believe to realize what i believe and operate from it is standard but how did i come to believe this what's informing my belief and again for entrepreneurship um the embrace of uncertainty is obviously necessary now what gets in the way of embracing uncertainty is fear mm -hmm. the fear of is this a mistake am i about to make a mistake as a culture and in business i think that disproportionately we focus on the fearing the consequences of our actions and decisions but we don't equally concern ourselves with the consequences of our inaction we don't worry about the things we don't do right and arguably that is as significant if not more than the things that we do do so in business and entrepreneurship what we don't do might look like lost opportunities lost possibilities and clearly we shouldn't do everything but i think that at the core asking ourselves what's informing my belief and is there fear influencing me if so where does the fear come from Fear isn't always bad. Fear may have come from practical life experiences, but to look at the thought. So the answer to the question, "What's informing my belief?" is thought. So think of it this way: in life, at the core, belief. Spiraling out of belief, thoughts, millions. Out of those millions of thoughts, feelings. Because thought and feeling work together in tandem, and we get stuck in a groove. of old beliefs, old thoughts and old feelings and that's why people struggle with change. Now, clearly the entrepreneur is trying to affect and access change by creating something that's stimulating. So, but entrepreneurs are nevertheless just people. Right? So, not to get stuck in the groove, not to just accept known wisdom. but to look at that wisdom and question it next why do we think it's wisdom and it may have worked for a period of time and things change again i can't overemphasize the importance of not getting stuck in the rational analytical mindset again those should be tools in the mind's toolbox right but think of it this way it's kind of like having binocular is affixed to your face you can dig down very well to miss what's out here and i have found that my greatest instincts and insights have not come from analyzing or rational thinking i'm not limiting the importance of them there are times when those are necessary but to tune in to a deeper way of knowing and i know this that curse me in therapy all the time when i first began working as a therapist i was exhausting myself i was thinking so much now it's effortless i don't really think i allow it to come to me it has an emergent quality and this word emergent which describes quantum physics think of emergent as a bubbling up like it will come then is the opposite of newtonian and cartesian cartesian referring to descartes reductive analyzing whereby just digging down and analyzing analyzing again that has its place 
but as a general way of knowing, I prefer the emergent quality, setting the intention and knowing it will bubble up. Because given the fact that there is no separation, I can access all the intelligence and all the wisdom that ever was and is right in the nanosecond. Once I stop blocking myself from it, it's not that I'm a genius. I can tap into the genius energy of the universe. Right. Fascinating. Very fascinating. Well, a uh, lot of thought provoking things that you have mentioned. Uh, definitely something to deep dive into. Now, let me uh, ask you a question that I ask all my speakers. Um, Mel, and I think we'll wrap up the first part. If you could turn back time and become 25 years old again, uh, what were the three pieces of advice you would give yourself uh, so that you could achieve financial freedom, maybe peace uh, with life, achieve your purpose, whatever you want to define it that way. But what pieces of advice could you give yourself? Hmm. I'm, I'm pausing because I'm not jumping into responding to your question. Because you see, your question presumes if I could go back, I would choose a different path mm -hmm. than what I chose. Yeah. Now, I didn't take education or academics very seriously uh, as a young man in high school or in college. Frankly, it wasn't until I went to graduate school at 40 that I paid attention and actually realized that perhaps I was smarter than I thought I was. Because prior to that time, I thought my intelligence honestly was average. I remember my mother coming to a lecture I gave when she was in her late 80s. And she looked at me and she said, this is not the person I know. How did this happen? And so I think the important piece here is that intelligence has a plasticity to it. Mm -hmm. It is not fixed. Um, so coming back to your question, um, I guess I might have chosen now, knowing what I know, um, in my 20s, not to have been partying as much as I was and um, being as hedonistic as I was. I went to college uh, during the Vietnam War, so I'm a product of the counterculture. I was an anti-war activist, which I don't regret in any way. But in the decade after that, um, I allowed myself to get lost. Mm -hmm. But perhaps I had to get lost to find myself. Right? So I am a, a, always innate believer of why can't I? Whereas some people will think why I can't. Um, but the other thing is coming back into my 20s, what else would I think about? I probably would have cultivated more attention toward health. I've been lucky in my life and that I have been healthy, but I might have built a better foundation um, for health. Um, so if I had to do over again, those would be the two things, but I'm not prone trying to change the past or regretting the past, you know, regret. I learn from things that I would do differently, but I wouldn't wish that I had done them differently necessarily. All right. Very nice, Mel. Thank you so much. Uh, you have know, shared a lot with us, the audience, I'm sure, uh, has has given them enough uh, enough thought to to think and go deeper a little bit into why they believe what they believe and and change some of those uh, words that you mentioned and 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 rethink uh, about possibilities. So thank you once again for being part of this summit. But Mel has graciously accepted to a bonus session with us. So if you have not bought your all access pass, go ahead and do that, and we will see you in the bonus session. Mel, thank you very much again. My pleasure, Anish. Welcome back to the Science of Inspiration Summit. This is the bonus session that Mel is doing for us, trying to share uh, the knowledge around quantum physics and how that could help us as entrepreneurs do something maybe from today itself to start making ourselves move onward and upward on our journey. So Mel, back to you. Okay, so Anish, um, things for entrepreneurs to think about, things that I have extrapolated from the science and the philosophy is again, to hold up my thought that's informing me and to ask myself, where is that thought coming from? Now, if I can identify my thought as creating apprehension, anxiety, or fear, I want to look at that thought and not operate from that thought. Mm. I want to operate from a deeper place. So 
I make a distinction between thought and thinking. Thought just happens. Ordinarily, we don't know we're aware of it. Thinking is what I'm doing when I can see my thought and not be it. Mm. So thinking allows me to spiral up to a higher, more sovereign place of knowing. So first piece of advice for entrepreneurs is don't operate from thought. See the thought, don't judge it, ask yourself what is informing that thought, and then you're accessing that nanosecond where you can access greater potential and greater wisdom. Secondly, anxiety is rooted often in self-esteem issues, and it's rooted in our discomfort, if not fear, of uncertainty. So. If I must know the future, if I need to know the future, then I'm going to be rooted in fear and anxiety. That's not going to serve me, my business, or anyone around me. So I'm not suggesting that we walk blindly into the future. We need to do all our deliberations and calculations. Think of it this way. Your entrepreneurial efforts shouldn't get bogged down as though you're playing a chess match. You're sitting back and you're taking 15 minutes between moves because you're calculating every possibility. That's determinism. That comes from Newtonian thinking. Certainly, you want to apprise yourself of what's going on and evaluate, but you need to be in the quantum flow, in the movement. See, when we're in movement, not static in analyzing, then what I know now is fine, but six seconds from now or six minutes or six hours from now, there will be that emergent quality. More will bubble up to the surface because I am in movement and I am in flow. Mm -hmm. The other thing, which applies to everyone, but entrepreneurs in particular for our conversation, are self-esteem issues, which impact the vast majority of people. So self-esteem is, in my, in my regard, is a misnomer. People don't understand self-esteem. I think they confuse self-esteem with what I call other esteem. Other esteem is, what do I think you will think of me? Mm -hmm. And therefore, I then manipulate myself and betray myself to get you to think a certain way of me. Yeah. Right? That is not authentic self-esteem. It's setting other people up as your judge. And as I'm fond of saying, the only person that can judge me is the person that works in the courtroom and wears the long black robes. Otherwise, it's people with opinions. So entrepreneurs need to be cautious about their concern about what they think other people think of them. Now, if there are people in your life that you attribute great wisdom to, by all means, you should care what they think. It doesn't mean you necessarily should accept it. But to take ordinary people's opinions and elevate them because you're concerned of what they will think of you will absolutely decimate your entrepreneurial spirit and energy. It's about you need to put wind in your sails yeah. and then navigate. Wind in the sails and then navigate uncertainty. Eyes wide open, but don't operate from an inner fixed business plan, so to speak. Because that business plan is out of date the moment you finish writing it, right? Right? So yeah. you can create a plan as long as you understand that you're going to have to be modifying it and tending to it day in and day out. If you think of it as a fixed thing, then you're denying the fact that reality is not fixed. And you're going to be blinded by your inability to navigate what's coming at you. And whatever's coming at you, don't go like this to it. Go like this. Because when we can embrace adversarial issues, when we can embrace what we fear, the fear dissipates. And that allows us to navigate effectively. So those would be my tips. Develop authentic self-esteem. Easier said than done. If for anyone, or any of your viewers or listeners are interested, I've written articles, books, podcasts on all of this, um, and easy to find them. Developing authentic self-esteem, 
embracing uncertainty and developing the ability to think rather than just be the byproduct of your thoughts. Mm. Those would be the keys. Very nice. And I think the last one is very important. You know, thinking is observing your own thought. It's like, you know, what David Bohm and J.K. Krishnamurti spoke a lot about that the, you know, the observer is the observed, um, which is a very, very popular thing that happens, you know, in, in the ancient, ancient texts of Hindu. Um, yes. And this, so I think many people are put off by what they feel is a spiritual approach to that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, people react in different ways. That that never troubled me. But I, I came after it in a pragmatic way. So all of my work ends up being profoundly spiritual, mm. but I don't operate from the premise of spirituality because then I feel like I'm trying to sell something, right? So I rather lead you down the path and in the end you find that reality is profoundly spiritual right. because that allows me to work with people who don't see themselves that way. So the spirituality is the end result of living in a reality that is inseparable, participatory, uncertain, and full of unimaginable possibility. What could be more spiritual? Yeah, fascinating, Mel. This is amazing. Uh, really, really interesting interview. And, and thank you again so much for sharing your wisdom, your golden nuggets with us. I'm sure the audience is, uh, has taken a lot of notes and I appreciate it. I look forward to talking to you again, uh, maybe listening to you on a podcast, maybe bringing you on my podcast. That'll be another honor. Uh, but thank you once again, Mel, for everything that you did. And Anish, I'd like to extend an invitation to you to come on to my podcast, The Possibility Podcast. Let's do that soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mel. And with that, uh, thank you for listening. Guys, keep listening to the other interviews uh, in the Inspiration of Science of Inspiration Summit. Talk soon.